Uh, thank you very much, Samar. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, and I would like to, if I may, at the outset, thank my colleagues, uh, not only Samar, but uh, in particular, Karsten Fink and Masaid Khan, who is seated over there, and who will answer all of the detailed questions uh, for a mammoth work, really, because it's quite something to collect uh, the statistics from as many countries as we have uh, to try to give a picture of what's going on in the world of intellectual property. I would like to uh, make a few very brief comments, um, which would be numbers, China, Asia, and uh, in, generally, in general, uh, some changing uh, composition, uh, trying to make sense of what we're seeing in the statistics. So in terms of numbers, again, we see you know, growth and growth that is much higher than the growth rates that, are, that one sees in GDP at the national level or uh, at the world level, for the most part, in respect of intellectual property. So again, uh, it's a message that's consistent with the, the one that we've seen in, in previous years. This is the fifth successive year of growth. And by the way, I should have said, we're talking about 2014, uh, because we need to collect all the statistics and then um, to process them. So that, uh, I think, is in itself a message. And it's, if you like, uh, one of the measures of, of the changing nature of the economy and, and of the uh, arrival of the knowledge economy. Specifically, Patents, uh, patent filings grew worldwide by 4.5% in 2014, up to 2.68 million. Um, trademarks, you know, there is a, me a measurement question because you can apply for a trademark, uh, um, well, under the various systems in either of two ways, generally. A so-called multi-class system, so you would apply for one mark which covers various classes of goods and services in the same application or in some countries you have to apply uh, make a separate application for each class of goods and services that you are uh, seeking trademark protection in relation to uh, that creates this measurement problem so what we do is uh, in this report is go by the total number of classes uh, to uh, as the as the indicator uh, and worldwide that grew by 6% in 2014, up to 7.45 million classes. Uh, industrial designs or designs uh, experienced a change. It's the first fall uh, in the growth of filings um, in more than 20 years, the first decline, so it's a little unusual, and they fell by 8.1% worldwide and again there in terms of measurement what we measure is the number of designs uh, for which an application is, is made. I'm uh, only going to make what reference to one other, I'm not going to deal with utility models but if you want to talk about those, fine. Uh, but plant varieties, plant variety protection I think is worth a mention. Uh, it's only a reasonably small number, about 15,600 worldwide but it grew by 3.3% in 2014. So uh, that's so much for numbers. Then if I uh, may make, as I said, a comment on China. Well, um, it's really quite extraordinary, as we have discussed repeatedly over the last several years, but it is quite extraordinary, the, the numbers coming out of China. Uh, so it's the largest um, patent filing office. So if you look at the numbers received by any patent office in the world, the largest number is received by China. Uh, and it's uh, approaching one million. It's 928,000, which is extraordinary. You drop them to the US United States Patent and Trademark Office, which is 580,000 in round figures, 578,000, and then to Japan, which is 325,000 in round figures. 
So uh, quite extraordinary. Now, when you look at the total number of applications that an office received, of course, they received them from residents, you know, nationals, if you like, and they received them from <coughs> foreigners. And when you look at resident, uh, where um, Chinese nationals or enterprises are filing worldwide, you also see that they're the largest number of filers worldwide. Uh, not only does the office receive the largest number, but Chinese nationals and enterprises <coughs> file the largest number uh, worldwide. So they filed uh, about 837,000 patent applications worldwide. Uh, and again, that compares to uh, residents of the US filing about 500,000 and Japan about 465,000. Uh, so this is quite extraordinary in itself. You go to trademarks, you get a similar story, um, with China being the largest office again on class counts, you know, which I explained, <coughs> 2.2 million. And the next is the US, 471,000. So the, these numbers are quite eloquent, really, quite extraordinary. And then the third is the European office, the OHIM as it's called. Uh, the European Trademark Office around about 331,000. Um, so, uh, and then again, taking the angle of where are Chinese enterprises filing worldwide, we see that China has uh, overtaken Germany now as the largest origin of filing activity worldwide in the area of trademarks. So. It's quite an extraordinary story, and just to complete it uh, on industrial designs, um, similar, although a 14.4% decline in applications uh, in China, but nevertheless it tops, it leads the field, and in plant varieties um, it is second to the European Union Com Community Plant Variety Office. Uh, so that's a story in itself, I think. So good numbers, better than uh, other sectors of the uh, of economic activity, let's say. China is uh, assuming a, a position of predominance numerically, numerically, and we're talking about numbers here. Now, as far as Asia more generally is concerned, of course, a big explanation for Asia more generally is China. Uh, yeah, in it's the, the dominant figure, let's say. Uh, nevertheless, what we do see um, is that Asia now accounts for the bulk of IP filing activity worldwide. Uh, it's the largest IP filing uh, region in the world, uh, if you like, the uh, largest IP uh, producer in the world. So Asia's total share uh, or share of, of world total, it's now at 60% for patents, 52% for trademarks and 67% for designs. So this is a change that has occurred, a rather dramatic change that has occurred in the course of the last uh, 10 to 20 years. and. Uh, with respect to Asia, it's in numbers, of course, dominated by China, Japan, and the Republic of Korea in particular. Uh, but we do see, and that would be my third point, that we do see uh, some greater take-up uh, of in the use of the intellectual property system uh, worldwide by middle-income countries uh, with some uh, quite strong performances. Um, of course, this is mainly in the trademark area, but not exclusively. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. I think um, uh, Iran stands out as one example, uh, where we see that from Iran, 18.5% uh, increase uh, in patent applications. Uh, and in trademarks, where are they, Ross? Can you help me out? Uh, they don't feature so much, but designs, I think. Yes, an 83% increase in design uh, applications. So that's quite interesting, I think. Uh, India is also uh, recording some interesting numbers. 
uh, 15% increase in trademarks, uh, a 9, nearly 10% increase in designs. Uh, so that's, that's uh, I think, another interesting development. Um, what was my final point? Oh, yes, I've covered it. I've covered Asia and I've covered other middle income. Uh, so I'll leave my comments at that point, uh, but we're happy to take any questions, particularly my colleagues. Uh, you know, can you explain a bit more about uh, the industrial design decline? Why is that happening? Mm, good question. Carsten, do I have a shot? Uh, well, I have a statistical answer, um, but not a full explanation. The statistical answer is China. Um, you saw a rapid decline in industrial design activity in China, uh, so they had negative growth, or they had a decline of 14.4%. Um, and because China accounts for such a large share of the global figures, uh, such a sharp decline in China translates into negative growth uh, at the global level. Um, I would say that for most of the other major offices, the growth performance has been, has been mixed. Some offices seeing growth, uh, some offices seeing declines. Uh, but the reason we saw a decline globally is entirely due to China. Yeah. Al although you could add that you know, there is a decline in a couple of other countries uh, for design um, activity. So um, Australia minus nearly 5%, Japan minus nearly 5%, Turkey minus nearly 5%. But Kasten's okay. explanation is the predominant one. But uh, is there an explanation for why? No, it's a good uh, question and an interesting one because on the one hand you see uh, designs becoming a more important feature of innovation everywhere uh, and one would expect from that that you would get more filing activity um, and uh, on the other hand I suppose we have to consider also uh, things like the uh, length of the product life cycle um, the appropriateness of design protection as it is generally, I think many countries have considered this question, uh, is this the best way to protect designs in, in, uh, in industry and in innovation? Yeah. Sorry? Excuse me. What, are the other, what are the other ways? Well, there are no other ways, you know, so um, the only other way is to rely on your lead uh, advantage, uh, but you risk being copying. But, you know, it really re would require an in-depth study and survey, I'd say, of industry to get to the bottom of this one. Because let's take fashion, and I'm speaking anecdotally here, but in fashion, uh, you or in automobile, uh, you know, a successful design is something they really want to protect. Um, and the same would be true of, of, of some of the... Uh, features of uh, smartphones, technology, and so forth. Uh, but in other areas, you know, the number of emulators might be reduced, uh, it, it, uh, or might not be significant. Um, it's a, it's an interesting question. I think it, 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 we I can't give an answer without you know a lengthy analysis. I would say. No, I, I agree, and I think it would be. Wrong, wrong to speculate on what's going on. Um, we did see in 2013 there was pretty much zero growth as far as I remember it. Uh, so that in some sense, you know, I mean, we weren't entirely surprised not to see growth, maybe a bit surprised to see a fall of 14.4%. Um, um, but I think, you know, what's really driving that, I, I don't think it would be appropriate to speculate. <coughs> Jamie. Hi, I'm Jamie from Associated Press. Um, I assume that the use of the Great Wall of China is something that has not been trademarked, <laughs> that, that you are allowed to do that. But um, for, your, for your nice little graphic here. What, uh, just about China, I mean, obviously, the, um, we've seen this increase, but what does it say about China more globally? I mean, there's been a lot of sort of stereotype about China, how, how does this debunk the sort of myth about China? Mm. 
Well, look, I think the most that you can say uh, about the numbers is that it demonstrates a massive buy-in to the intellectual property system on the part of China. Uh, you know, they are uh, the number one users of it in the world. So that's a very significant thing. Now, beyond that, uh, when you come to consider the re whole relationship of China to intellectual property, it's a more complex story than, than that. Uh, but everything we see coming out of the policy pronouncements of the leadership uh, indicates an endorsement of the use of intellectual property. So strategically, uh, of course, innovation features extremely prominently in the uh, economic policy. Um, and the whole, as is said, uh, movement from uh, uh, made in China to created in China. So strategically, the uh, Chinese authorities are placing an enormous amount of importance on the, um, on the establishment of value addition across the economy uh, and on innovation. They're <coughs> also the second largest in absolute terms investors in research and development in the world. So uh, this is an area that China is taking extremely seriously. Can, can I just mm. follow up on that? Yeah. <clears throat> is it safe to assume that not all patents are made alike or e equal? I mean, in other words, a quantity does not necessarily translate into quality, and is this push yeah. by the Chinese government maybe just window dressing in a way? And or I mean, is there any way to sort of qualify the yeah. real, the concrete importance of well, these numbers? Well, uh, they are numerical indicators. Um, the fact is, we don't have a an accepted metric for quality. Uh, so. It's as misleading to make a positive statement in favor of uh, numbers standing for quality as it is to make a negative statement that they don't stand for quality uh, because we don't know uh, at the end of the day uh, here uh, at this stage. And you can explore the metric question, uh, and many people are, and many economists are working on it, but it's quite difficult. Um, and in a sense, I always say, you know, if we had a good metric, you wouldn't need a venture capital industry. You know, uh, we don't know. That's a, one of the features of innovation at the at the outset. So uh, we can just notice the numerical thing. We can notice also the st strategic importance. I don't think uh, that you can place such strategic importance on the transformation of industry across a country as window dressing. Personally, I would say, you know, it's too important. I guess maybe I should add yeah. maybe a little bit. No, no, I, no, I understand that I, what but, you mean. But, yeah. but, uh, but I mean, what evidence do you have that this is just patent uh, applications for the sake of patent applications? Well, I think in any system, uh, you get a, um, a distortion uh, in the use of the system depending on the available incentives. So. There are incentives in China, as elsewhere, by the way, you know, uh, which would encourage patent applications. They might be subsidization of uh, the, pro the fees for filing. Uh, they may be rewards that, that uh, researchers get. Um, but these exist, you know, in, in every country. I wouldn't single out China in this respect. Uh, it's part of a, a strategy of... of uh, trying to secure competitive advantage through innovation. Um, and so I don't think we could uh, single it out in any way in this regard. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, Peter Kenny from Independent Newspapers in South Africa. Uh, you flagged the plant applications this year. Now, can you explain why plant applications are significant and, and also uh, I, see, yeah. I see China's uh, tops there once again, but uh, Ukraine is second. Uh, mm. Is there any reason for this? Is it to do with the international agricultural uh, negotiations? Or no, I, I mean, I, uh, 
uh, signaled it mainly because it's usually forgotten. Um, and I do think it's a quite an important area uh, because we do face a challenge in the world uh, in relation to agriculture. First, a challenge of feeding a growing population that's going to be 9 or 10 billion by 2050. And that will require increases in agricultural productivity. And second, a cha challenge of adaptation in relation to climate change. Uh, so, what are the available uh, innovation possibilities for agriculture? And one of them is, which has been used for thousands of years, new plant varieties. Uh, and new plant varieties uh, increase yield uh, in the agricultural area. You know, they have other applications like ornamentals. Uh, uh, and uh, but they increase yield in grains and in fruits. They introduce new variety, new new diversity in the marketplace. Take apples and look at the varieties that are available these days, for example. So it's an important area, and it's a very accessible area. Uh, so if you look at who's leading, well, Netherlands, which is the flower basket of Europe, of course, uh, is number one. But you see very important activity in a number of other countries, for example, Kenya, Tanzania, Tanzania, uh, Ethiopia in the cut flower markets, um, Colombia. Uh, so it's, a, it's an accessible and a very useful form of innovation, I think. It's not the only innovation in agriculture, of course, you've got, you've got um, machinery and, and uh, uh, genetic engineering, amongst other things, so it comes into the patent system as well. Sorry, can I ask you more questions? Sure. Um, sure. Going back to China, mm. the, or, or just more broadly, do you break down uh, the origin of the patent applications from between private and public sector? I mean, is there, is, I mean, or maybe that is a distinction isn't relevant in China or as mm. relevant. I mean, I, I, what I'm trying to get yeah. at is, with that yes. is, if presumably, a private sector applicant would be more attuned to customer customer design, uh, desires, whereas maybe a state player would be have some different interests. Is that? Um, I wouldn't make that assumption okay. necessarily uh, in an economy which is, uh, you know, still dominated by state-owned enterprises. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and which seems to be. Um, uh, having success in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I wouldn't necessarily make that assumption, but I don't think we have the breakdown, do we, Carsten? We don't have the breakdown um, public versus private, uh, privately owned company. Not here, but in some other contexts, and I'm happy to point you to these figures, we do publish figures on patent filings by universities and public research organizations. <coughs> uh, we did that, for example, for selected areas of technologies, nanotechnologies, 3D printing, robotics, uh, in our World Intellectual Property Report. Uh, and there, indeed, what you found in the case of China was that the share of um, universities and public research organizations was higher compared uh, to, to, to other countries. Um, but in the case of companies, um, you know, for example, the two biggest Chinese filers under the Patent Corporation Treaty System, which is ZTE Technologies, which is a state-owned enterprise, and Huawei Technologies, which I understand is a private enterprise. So it's not obvious whether that tells you something 